Ah, uh, okay. Shall I start? Or can I start? Okay. So, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, all of you. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for showing interest. Of course, a very special welcome to our three speakers today. Professor George Patterson, whom I see somewhere in the background, but you'll see him on stage quite soon, uh, Diana Duhanova and Christoph Schneider. I'm going to introduce them in a bit, but before that, I'd like to just uh, tell you a few words about the concept behind the symposium today and how it fits in with what the program that I work for uh, is, is, is meant to, to, to develop. Basically, uh, we have a new research program at the Institute, which is called the World in Pieces Program, to reflect the spirit of the times. Uh, the program is a continuation of uh, the program on Eurasia that was running for several years from uh, 2018 until the end of last year. So now, for us, this is quite an important and symbolic event because this is, in a way, the inaugural event of our new program. And uh, in a way, uh, we felt that it plays on the main concept behind the program. Now, I'm not going to go into great details here, but just to give you a little bit of a sense of how uh, we came up with the idea of this lecture series and the symposium today. Basically, the symposium is very much about the phenomenon of rereading great literature and philosophy, revisiting great art. We do it all the time. And I guess when people say, as they often do, that every age has its Shakespeare, this is what they mean, that there's so many layers in Shakespeare that every age, every historical period finds something new and valuable about the writings of Shakespeare. It also means that every historical period does a different reading. And our historical moment now is no different. And unfortunately, the period we're living in is largely defined by uh, the war that is going on in Ukraine. And I think that on the one level, there is the war itself. On the other level, there is something which we could really define as a culture war over a fight over who is the inheritor of Russian philosophy, Ru Russian literature, who has the right to claim to possess it. And then how Russian is Russian philosophy, if it was a philosophy that was very much created in the context of an empire with different nationalities and so on. It's also a philosophy that was constantly in dialogue with the West. So when it presents itself as unique, in what sense is it unique? In what sense is it typically Russian? And so on and so forth. So I think that there are all these questions and related questions around that. And I think that there's also something which I see as uh, almost a tr there's almost some sort of tragic irony in the idea that on the one side you see Putin's regime, circles within the Russian Orthodox Church and so on, who are laying claim to Russian philosophy and Russian culture and so on and using it, weaponizing the whole tradition to justify the atrocities they're committing in Ukraine. On the other hand, you also hear sometimes calls that basically come to uh, a call to boycott Russian culture, which in a way could very well mean giving it to Putin and to his regime to use in whichever way they want. So I think that all these questions that arise there a part of the questions that I hope will come out in the symposium today, but also throughout the lecture series that I have in mind and that we'll be having during the next several months. Now, uh, I know you're not here to, to listen to me, <laughs> but to our two speakers, so I'll move very quickly to uh, briefly introducing uh, 
Diana and Christoph. I'd like to thank them once again for agreeing to come uh, to our institute. So uh, Diana Duhanova holds a PhD from Brown University. She defended her dissertation in 2018. At present, she is the visiting assistant professor of Russian at the College of the Holy Cross in the US. Her fields of research are Russian Orthodox theology and the topic of sexuality in Russian religious philosophy. She's a host on the New Books Podcast Network. And this is actually how we met with Diana. I just thought she had such interesting and insightful questions. Um, she has a forthcoming book, which is called Jesus of Bethlehem, Vasily Rozanov's Russian Orthodox Family Values. And today, she'll be talking about Vasily Rozanov. Uh, Christoph Schneider is the academic director of the Institute for Ortho Orthodox Christian Studies at Cambridge University. He has a PhD from the University of Zurich, his fields of specialization are Russian religious thought, especially Pavel Florensky, the thinker he's going to talk about today. He looks at topics like the philosophy of language, ecumenical dialogue between Orthodox and Protestant theology. He's published quite a lot on Florensky, on um, the philosophy of language and so on. For example, uh, he has a chapter in the Oxford Handbook uh, of Russian Religious Philosophy. George Patterson, one of our speakers, is one of the three editors of this book. Uh, recently, Christoph organized a very successful, I thought, conference on Florensky in Cambridge, which basically brought together not that many people, just because there are not that many people working on Florensky, but it was a very successful and interesting event. So uh, I'm giving the floor to Diana first. Uh, after that, Christoph will give his presentation and then we'll have the question and answer session at the end of uh, both talks. So thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you very much, Clemena, for inviting me to this event. In 1903, Pavel Florensky, a promising young mathematics student who would go on to become one of the most fascinating religious and aesthetic thinkers of the Russian religious renaissance, wrote an admiring letter to Vasily Rozanov, then already one of the most controversial religious thinkers and writers of the same era. A founding member of the St. Petersburg Religious Philosophical Society, the meetings of which were suspended later that year, Rosanov was notorious for his immense body of work on sexuality and reproduction and his determination to break the silence around matrimonial sexuality and disrupt the glorification of celibacy in the Russian Orthodox Church. Florensky's first letter glows with admiration for Rosanov. He states that when he first came across Rosanov's work, he understood that, quote, here is a true genius, a genius from birth, but one who is wholly unpolished seemingly does not work on himself, a man who is creating something new, preparing a great leap in our entire world view, and does not himself suspect it, who creates just as spontaneously as the river flows. A brief mutually admiring exchange followed this first missive, but it's only five years later, in 1908, that the two men begin an epistolary friendship that would last until Rosanov's death in 1917. Where Florensky's 1903 letter contains the slight admonition about Rosanov's unpolished genius, his 1908 letter is much more critical than it is admiring, a fact that seems to have inspired much more interest in the perpetually polemical thinker that was Rosanov. In the intervening time between the two letters, Florensky had radically changed his life direction, Rejecting a teaching position at the Imperial University after his graduation in 1904, he elected instead to study theology at the Ecclesiastical Academy at Sergei Fassad and intended to become a member of the black or celibate clergy. Those were the very members, of course, of the church hierarchy who bore the brunt of Rosanov's ire. Having embarked on this path, Florensky now viewed Rosanov, of course, in a very different light. 
Yet at the same time, in his first 1908 letter, he declared his intention to his true formal argumentation in favor of Rosenev's own spontaneous style. Quote, I will not hide the fact that despite my deep respect for you, despite my personal love for you, you are my enemy and I'm yours. It is necessary to reckon with you. And if you send me this challenge, I will accept it. But I will not write articles to you. I will just note down some thoughts. In this way, it's more straightforward and will consider the issue more honestly." End quote. This letter addresses, in one way or another, the two key issues that would occupy both men over their years of correspondence, the Russian Orthodox theology of matrimonial sexuality and the so-called Jewish question concerning both the status of Jews in Russia in the early 20th century and the complexities of Jewish theology, ritual, and custom. Admonishing Vasily Vasilievich for setting conditions under which he would be willing to fully accept Christ in Orthodox tradition, that is, his demand that Russian Christianity return to what he considered its indigenous roots as a phallocentric religion, Florensky accused Rosenov of wanting to give himself to Christ, quote, like a Jew, provisionally, end quote. For Florensky, who had completed his, uh, most of his key monograph, The Pillar and Ground of Truth, by this time, Unconditional acceptance of Christ, uh, excuse me, um, unconditional acceptance of Christ and the Orthodox tradition was an undebatable prerequisite to any discussion of changes to church policy. And throughout their correspondence, he endeavored to act as a pastor to Rosenov, hoping to guide him in this direction. Rosenov, for his part, had perceived Florensky a potential to infuse the celibate order with a consciousness of what was called the holy flesh. The two men would grow closer again in 1911, when Florensky once again changed course, feeling a calling to marry Anna, the sister of his close friend. Pavel Alexandrovich was ordained as a member of the white or married priesthood. This was for many around him a shocking decision, given that he was previously known to those close to him to have an aversion to marriage, seeming to fit the definition of the eunuch from birth. But Rosenov was convinced that Florensky chose marriage because he sensed its spiritual superiority, and that it would di direct his views in Rosenov's direction through experience. Just as Florensky often fills the role of pastor, pastid, for Rosenov, the latter attempts to inculcate in him a sense of matrimonial piety. Florensky's marriage brings the men closer than ever together, with their letters taking on an increasingly intimate and informal tone as they deep, uh, delve deeply into the mystic nature of matrimonial copulation and fatherhood. I've been studying Rosenov's Uber and his relationship with Florensky and other members of the Russian Orthodox clergy for over a decade. And for most of that time, I focused on what I characterize as Rosenov's quest to create a positive Russian Orthodox discourse of matrimonial sexuality, both in his own writing and through his dialogues and polemics with churchmen. Though he remains, of course, a controversial figure in Russian Orthodox history, and it'll become clear why in a few minutes, uh, many of his contemporaries, as well as present-day clergy, actually credited him with pushing the church to recognize the importance of a comprehensive language of sex and family for the survival and flourishing of both the church and the Russian nation as a whole. And he also has uh, uh, defenders among contemporaries, present-day clergy, who, um, for example, Andrei Tkachev, a priest and a prominent commentator on Russian Orthodox family values today, has praised him frequently as the orthodox Freud. What I have focused on significantly less in my work is the much darker side of his legacy, which is the topic of today's presentation, his vituperative writings on Jews and Judaism. Widely characterized in the scholarship as an anti-Semitic Judeophile, Rosenev's correspondence with Florensky allows us to trace how his fascination with Jewish beliefs and rituals, which sanctified all things physical, sexual, and reproductive, which he had praised for many years as exemplary, the spirit of which he hoped to infuse in the Russian church, increasingly turned into bitter anti-Semitism and a fear that the Jews were destroying Russia. Indeed, it is precisely on this topic that the two thinkers, in my view, find the most common ground. Rosenov most ardently identifies himself as a Russian, as a Christian, and a believer in Russian messianism in the course of creating his anti-Jewish mythologies. Florensky's influence in the development of Rosenov's thought on his topic becomes clear in the course of their correspondence, 
and is reinforced by the relatively recent attribution to Florensky of some of the most outrageous components of Rosanov's 1913-1914 publication, The Olfactory and Tactile Attitude of Jews to Blood. The majority of their dialogue on this topic in the letters takes place in 1913. This was the year of the trial of Mendel Belis, a Jewish superintendent at a brick factory in Kiev, who was charged in 1911 with ritually murdering the 13-year-old Christian schoolboy, Andrei Yushinsky, in order to use his blood for the preparation of Passover matzah. It was not by chance, as Dominic Rubin writes in his monumental 2010 study, Holy Russia, Sacred Israel, that the case against Belize was opened just a month after the Third State Duma began debating a law that would ratify the abolition of the Jewish Pale of Settlement. The accusation was exploited by the Black Hundreds to whip up pogroms on the right and by the liberal press at home and in Europe to criticize Russian backwardness and superstition. So outrageous and groundless was the blood libel that even well-known reactionaries called for Belize's release. But Rosanov insisted on the probability of his guilt. For example, in his writings for the anti-Semitic papers, Nova Evremia and Zemshina, and even insisted that the murder victim be declared a martyr. However, like many others in the guilty camp, the uh, major question was not so much Belize's guilt in itself as the existence of Jewish ritual murder and whether Jews were using it to wage an international conspiracy to undermine Russia. Rosanov's public writings about the affair led to his exile from the Religious Philosophical Society and cost him friendships and collaborations among members of intelligentsia, perhaps most notably his follow, uh, former fellow travelers, Dmitry Merezhkovsky and Zinaida Gipius. Florensky, however, successfully implored his friend over the course of many letters to keep his contributions a secret during his lifetime. I will turn in a minute to a detailed reading of several passages from the 1913 letters. But first, I'd like to take a slight, somewhat personal detour, which is something I don't usually do in the course of academic analysis and discussion. But I myself am a Russian Jew. I'm a member of one of the major immigration waves of the 20th century, having come to the United States as a refugee in 1991. I'm also a largely non-practicing Jew with an academic interest primarily in Russian Orthodoxy and in sexuality in Russian Christianity, which originally stems from my work on Mikhail Bulgakov as a master student. My work on Rosanov grew out of my fascination as an early PhD student with his aforementioned dialogues with Orthodox churchmen regarding the ways in which the relative valuation of matrimony vis-a-vis -vis celibacy impacted the Russian culture as a whole. And for many years, I asserted that Rosanov's anti-Semitic writings were the least interesting aspect of his oeuvre, in part because they are, in my opinion, the least original, relying quite heavily on ancient tropes around the blood libel and the supposed threats that Jewish communities pose to Russia as a whole. However, observing how Russian Jewish history has started to repeat itself in the wake of Russia's war on Ukraine, I've had to reevaluate my viewpoint. The blood libel has sadly reemerged in the public discussion of the role of Russian Jews in the war and must be examined in its full historical context. As today's Russian Jewish population rapidly shrinks, with thousands leaving the country in a massive new immigration wave and many thousands more seeking a way out, the community finds itself in a very strange discursive space within contemporary Russian national ideology. On the one hand, Russian Jews have enjoyed an unprecedented level of acceptance at the federal level during the Putin era, with the president accepting and framing in his public addresses Russian Jews as a distinct cultural and ethnic group fully integrated into Russian history. He even allowed the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center to open in Moscow in 2012. <coughs> Excuse me. On the other hand, of course, this acceptance has been conditional based on a separation of good Jews, that is, those loyal to the regime and dedicated to serving the Russian national and imperial project, and bad Jews, those perceived either as disloyal or concerned only with their own community. As in his relationship with the Russian Muslim community, Putin's strategy has been to preempt so-called extremism by defining the appropriate parameters within which those ethnic and religious minorities that are considered traditional in Russia may operate. Such an attitude is clear, for example, in Putin's 2022 Rosh Hashanah or Jewish New Year address, which reads, quote, it is very important that while retaining their loyalty to old spiritual traditions, Russia's Jews make a hefty contribution to the preservation of cultural diversity in our country 
to strengthening inter-ethnic concord and the principles of mutual respect and religious tolerance, end quote. Increasingly, in the context of today's Russian messianic pro-war ideology and propaganda, which promotes the idea that the war in Ukraine is a denazification project, the good Jew is one who supports the war effort while the bad Jew opposes it. And of course, Ukrainian President Zelensky has become Russia's key example of the latter, with Dmitry Medvedev attacking him as a treacherous Jew. Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, the former chief rabbi of Moscow, who left the country rather than succumb to pressure to support the war, has warned the community of rising hostilities and encouraged Russian Jews to follow him into emigration after a prominent Moscow official labeled the Chabad Hasidic sect a supremacist cult for their prioritization of Russian Jewry rather than Russian nationalism. Attempts to stem the tide of Jewish emigration and assert control over the community include the Russian Justice Ministry petition to a Moscow court in July 2022 to liquidate the offices of the Jewish Agency for Israel, the semi-governmental organization which encourages and facilitates Jewish immigration to Israel, and which has also been at the forefront of assisting Jews in Ukraine. Putin accused the organization of high treason. If the agency is closed, it will not only stem the tide of immigration, but also suspend the organization's nationwide Jewish educational activities in an, uh, in an attempt to prevent the spreading of such so-called treasonous messaging. Further, openly anti-Jewish rhetoric has once again entered the country's mainstream media, with popular talk show host Vladimir Solovyov, himself having Jewish ancestry, naming on air a number of Russian Jews who he accused of being insufficiently patriotic. In a September 18th article in Moskovsky Komsomolets, a hybrid Russian daily, a senior and veteran writer named Dmitry Popov compiled a list of well-known Jews who he called foreign agents, a term that the Russian government frequently applies to its perceived enemies. And perhaps the most egregious example of rising anti-Semitism and the re-emergence of the blood libel is the following passage from the article by Agnia Krengel, a frequent contributor to the Strategic Culture Foundation, a conservative Russian think tank concerning the prominent Jewish philosopher Bernard Henry Levy who, uh, in his support of Ukraine. Quote, this 74-year-old French citizen, born in a family of Algerian Jews, smells blood with his nose and without delay flies to lap it up for good money, end quote. There are countless other examples of this rhetoric. Now, this quotation from Krengel could just as easily have come from Rosanoff and Florensky's correspondence in 1913 which incidentally is the year of Florensky's ordination as a priest. And since my time is limited, I will bring to your attention just a small selection of passages from these letters. As becomes clear through a close reading of the correspondence, Florensky plays a significant role in Rosanov's transition to full-blown anti-Semitism and his growing fear of the Jewish rituals, like circumcision and the mikvah or the ritual bath, that so fascinated him in earlier writings. In late 1913, he would write in his article, An Important Historical Question, that Jewish blood sacrifices continued after the Babylonian exile. Quote, the question of sacrificial murders by the hands of world Jewry of Christian boys can now be reckoned as solved in favor of a positive answer with the same fullness, exactitude, and reliability as the proofs of geometric theorems, end quote where Rosanoff had previously been contemptuous of scientists who tried to deduce the noumenal essence of Judaism via the analysis of Archean rituals, under Florensky's influence, he began to do just that. As Dominic Rubinet writes, quote, the defamation of the much lauded ritual of circumcision, the about turn on Jewish diet and the sudden bewitchment with mathematical certainty would certainly look less schizophrenic if one postulates the impact of Florensky on Rosanoff's thinking, end quote. In Florensky's 1913 letters to Rosanov, the truth of Jewish ritual murder becomes the sine qua non of Christian truth, with the, defeat of Jews can, with the defeat of Jews can only be accomplished at its expense. In a letter dated September 28, 1913, he refers to a brochure written by Rosanov about ritual murder, which showed him their unanimity. Criticizing the discourse of the Bailey's case, he writes, quote, a strange alternative, Either the Jews commit ritual murders, so Belize is guilty, or Belize is innocent, and then, therefore, the Jews do not commit murders. I don't understand why everyone's eyes are on Belize. I'm sure that Belize is innocent, or at least only involved, and embroiled in some kind of complicated relationship. If I were a jury member, I would acquit Belize. In any case, there is no serious evidence against him. But it still does not follow at all that the murder of Yushinsky was not ritualistic. 
What seems to me most characteristic is the challenge undoubtedly contained in this murder. If several people committed this murder, then couldn't they hide the traces of their crime? The situation of finding the body screams, look, we are not afraid of you. We are not criminals, we are executors of this truth. This challenge exists in all cases where a ritual murder has been initiated. This means that the point was not only to kill or even to draw blood, but mainly to make a national sacrifice for display to the whole world." End quote. If it is so, he writes, then it is the work not of poor Bailey's, but of someone much more powerful and much more religious. It is nonsense to suggest that ritual murder doesn't exist, he asserts. Later, he writes about uh, Daniel Falsone's refutation of ritual murder, where the scholar cites the Jewish taboo against consuming blood in any form, even from one's own bleeding gums. Florensky argues, quote, but why is it forbidden? Precisely because blood is something sacred, a taboo. Otherwise, there would be no need to forbid it. Uh, many cultures have prohibitions around certain animals which cannot be killed and eaten, but in specific times they are ceremoniously killed and served." End quote. Perhaps most outrageously, Florensky writes that he is, quote, a bit ashamed to admit that in this enlightened age, the Jew who drinks the blood of the goy, or the non-Jew, is much closer to me than one who does not, such as Bailey's. Those who drink it are Jews, the others are Yids, excuse me. Uh, scoundrel lawyers say, quote, Judaism is nonsense and Christianity is nonsense and blood is nonsense, no reason to fight. And I say Judaism and Christianity is religion and blood is holy and sacred and ritual murder is a big deal. But Judaism as a religion stands in opposition to Christianity, not as a cancellation of all religion, but as the highest religion, as an overcoming of Judaism. Christianity is the endless condensation of Judaism, which it is always trying to satisfy by temporary means. Hasids are correct in their own way, and they should be reinforced so that they might become Christians. But lawyers, they are truly the enemies of the human race, the rejectors of religion." End quote. In a letter dated October 26 to 28, 1913, Florensky is despondent and discouraged at Belize's acquittal, stating that the Russian Orthodox Church and society are doomed since they don't understand the reality of the trial and, quote, give in to the lawyers. He makes his own division between good and bad Jews, the religious and the secular, who all fall under the category of advocate, whom he blames for the decline of European society as a whole. Quote, but what can we do with them? They multiply faster than us at a simple arithmetic, and no matter what we do with them, there will come a time when there are more of them than of us. It is, I repeat, simple arithmetic, and against this there is only one remedy, castration, that is, a remedy that can only be applied if we reject Christianity. And finally, the question is, do we or do we not believe the Apostle Paul? A promise was made to Israel, that is fact, and the Apostle Paul affirms that all of Israel will be saved. And he kind of goes on like this for a while. And later he says, a minute later, a minute earlier, they will take us animals and maybe the last animals and drain our blood for kosher meat, but we must submit, end quote. Writing to Florensky on November 1st, 1913, Rosenhoff agrees with the existence and continued practice of ritual murder and the need to accept the phenomenon within certain limitations. And yet he reassures Florensky that, quote, we will completely regain our health and tell the Jew that he can draw the blood from his own infants. It is for us people to understand hu the human, to show fairness and not dare think of the wise and the terrifying. So he's basically telling Florensky that these are mysteries that are beyond human understanding. Uh, he uses mathematical reasoning to reassure his friend that uh, to borrow a slogan from an, the American white nationalist movement, the Jews will not replace them. He writes, for some reason the Jews, though they multiply faster than us, as you wrote, always have some sort of limit. Here is the great secret of Judaism. They are always succumbing. And as Russians, we must put our hope in God. He is our comfort and strength. And the Russian people is mystically very strong." End quote. By the end of 1913, these, in context, somewhat optimistic arguments, if we might call them that, give way to shared fear. In another passage, which contains accusations of the Jewish control of the media, that again could be found in any anti-Semitic screed written in Russia today, he tells Rosenhoff, quote, I am very frightened of the Jews. They seize everything and strangle us. I now see the truth that my laugh was immature. I thirst for nothing so much as a pogrom. 
there can be no other solution to the question. The Belize affair showed everything. Over nine years, they gobbled up the press and made it completely subservient. Uh, he goes on to say that all the literary organizations are in their hands, the funds for helping writers are in their hands, and they get into everything. As we can see from this very small selection, Rozanov has, by the end of 1913, transitioned from his call upon the Russian Orthodox to save Russian civilization from, by learning from Jewish ritual, familial, and social practices to completely uprooting and severing Jewish influence over Russian society. And what then is the next step? both for me personally as a Russian Jewish American scholar of Rosanov and for all of us scholars of Russian religious philosophy at a time when it is increasingly being deployed to uphold violent nationalist ideology. Does scholarship on Rosanov and Florensky have value beyond the investigation of anti-Semitic mythologies and of the darkest corners of Russian messianism? Is it possible, is it necessary to bracket the passages such as those quoted above and to study these thinkers without keeping the consciousness of their contribution to these ideologies front and center? These are the questions that I would like to reflect on and discuss with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Christoph, shall we continue with your paper and then we'll have the questions. Uh, after Christo. Mm -hmm. so thank you very much for the kind invitation. Wait. <coughs> so, uh, the enigma of truth in Pavel Ferensky towards a contemporary understanding of truth beyond modernity and postmodernity. Some academics and popular commentators have argued that we have entered a post-truth era. On the academic level, there is certainly no longer a consensus as to how to think of truth, let alone the one truth. But also in everyday life, particularly in the public and political sphere, truthful reporting of events and facts, at least if vital political and economic interests are at stake, seems to be the exception rather than the norm. And there is undoubtedly a connection between the philosophical or metaphysical loss of truth or that truth and our inability or unwillingness to recognize facts as true, even if they don't serve our own interests. It seems that what postmodern philosophers have been talking about for decades, though mainly in academic circles, has now become a public reality that can be recognized by everyone, even by people without any philosophical training or interest. Now, the Russian religious thinker Paul Ferensky, who lived between 1882 and 1937, addressed the question of truth in a radically different intellectual context. However, I believe that his work can still make an interesting contribution to contemporary debates about truth. As I will try to show, in his work we find a critique of both the modern and to some extent the postmodern understanding of truth. Of course, he died in 37, and at that time no one was talking about postmodernity. Ferensky's account of truth, as outlined in his work The Pillar and Ground of the Truth, published in 1914, is clearly a piece of Christian apologetics. The truth of Christianity and its central doctrines are presupposed right from the beginning. The author states uh, this very clearly on the first pages uh, of the book. Yet what is extraordinary is the philosophical strategy he pursues to present his idea of the Christian truth. The pillar and ground of the truth is primarily addressed to the Russian intelligentsia that was largely estranged from the church and the Christian tradition at the beginning of the 20th century. The author's reflections about truth are presented as the answer to a generally human quest for truth. I think that Ferensky's understanding of truth is intriguing for both the Christian reader who already shares the author's presuppositions as well as for the atheist agnostic or skeptic. 
Florensky's strategy, uh, Florensky's starting point uh, is the question of truth as it presents itself in the domain of abstract knowledge and theoretical thought, as he puts it. He raises the epistemological question of how we can recognize the truth as truth. Florensky's answer is that we need to acquire knowledge of the conditions of certitude. In other words, certitude is the key, or at least one of the key ideas in his epistemology. Florensky then reflects on the linguistic mediation in the act of recognizing and appropriating the truth. It is the judgment and not the proposition that fulfills this mediating function. Certitu certitude is, quote, the intellectual feeling of accepting the judgment pronounced as a true one. A truth claim needs to be asserted by someone. Truth is not something just out there that can be discovered and described by a detached observer. But it is self-involving and must be actively appropriated. Florensky later elaborates on this existential and self-involving aspect of truth-seeking and underlines the enormous spiritual and intellectual risks that this endeavor entails for the truth-seeker. Florensky differentiates between two different types of judgments. Judgments that are based on self-evident intuitive knowledge and judgments that are given indirectly that result from discursive reasoning. The first type he correlates to the law of identity and the latter type to the law of sufficient reason. Florensky's goal is to show that neither of these principles can provide a foundation for a philosophically and metaphysically convincing notion of truth. He questions the universal validity of the law of identity with respect to logic, epistemology, and ontology. So the law of identity states that for something to be and for something to be intelligible, it must be a determinate being. Likewise, for the human mind to think intelligibly, it must think something determinate, otherwise it is not thinking at all. Yet, Ferensky argues, paradoxically, that the, se the severe restrictions this principle imposes on epistemology and ontology backfire and open the door to subjectivism and irrationalism. For the intuition does not entail any reason for why its recipient should accept it as a true intuition, as truth, um, and thus lacks reasonableness. I'll explain what this means. So the intuition lacks reasonableness, according to Wrensky. The formula A equals A turns out to be a tautology, a generalization of self-identity that is inherent in every given. If present givenness is the epistemic criterion for the truth, Florensky explains, everything given must be regarded as true. Furthermore, if the law of identity is consistently applied, every given negates all other givens, for each one of them implies unique truth claim at the expense of all others. As a result, truth becomes incompatible with synchronic coexistence and diachronic succession. So we have a, a kind of atomism. Ferensky used the above outlined conception of givenness as underlying empiricism, rationalism, as well as Kantianism. In empiricism, we rely on the self-evidence of sensuous experience, and we believe that the perception of an external object can give a certain knowledge. In rationalism, we rely on the self-evidence of intellectual experience and believe that the self-perception of the subject is certain. Finally, in Kantianism, both sensuousness and reason are considered to be given. Of course, there's a lot more to say about this uh, critique, but uh, I don't have time to do that now. Forensky then turns to the second type of judgment, 
judgments that are based on discursive reasoning and the law of sufficient reason. The reason provided to explain a thing or state of affair is not self-evidently true, but is dependent on another reason, which in turn requires a further reason, and so forth ad infinitum. There are only two alternatives. Either we end up with an infinite regress and bad infinity, or we posit a highest being that terminates the whole series of explanatory links as uncaused cause. In Enlightenment theism, the latter approach was often resorted to to establish proofs of the existence of God. In Leibniz, for instance, uh, the principle of sufficient reason serves as the foundation of his cosmological argument in conjunction with the law of identity. Florensky rejects both alternatives as philosophically and theologically problematic. An infinite regress does not lead to any certainty, nor can the biblical God, uh, the biblical and Christian God, be identified with the highest being, conceived as the ultimate and the necessary ground of everything contingent, as in Leibniz. Using contemporary philosophical language, this would amount to embracing an ontotheological notion of God. In Ferenczi's own words, quote, faith with rational proofs is a monstrous product of human egotism that disregards God's supra-rationality. Ferenczi, to some extent, deconstructs some of the pillars of modernity, the two principles of rationality, as well as empiricism, rationalism, and Kantianism. But he has not yet answered the question of how we can arrive at the positive idea of the truth. Before I will give an account of Renski's understanding of truth, I will briefly examine the transition from modernity or to postmodernity, or at least one possible interpretation of this transition. I will then compare Ferensky's notion of truth to this postmodern understanding of the human condition. In, in a nutshell, according to the French philosopher Quentin Meyersou, postmodern philosophy states that it is unthinkable that the unthinkable be impossible. Ferensky, by contrast, wants to explore the unthinkable conditions of thinkability. Now, what do these rather be bewildering statements mean? I'm, I'm going to explain it. It's more than just postmodern jargon. So let me start with uh, postmodern philosophy. Meyerson describes a gradual de-absolutization of the two basic principles of rationality, the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason, in the history of Western philosophy. In Leibniz, whose cosmological argument I have already mentioned, these two principles are unconditionally valid. The existence of God can be inferred from the contingency of the world on the basis of these two principles. In Kant, however, the law of sufficient reason, or the law of causality, can no longer be applied beyond the phenomenal realm. Its range of validity is now limited to appearances. Yet Kant does not deny any relation between thought and the absolute. First, he maintains that the thing in itself exists, for otherwise there would be appearances without anything that appears, which is uh, impossible for him. Secondly, he holds the view that the thing in itself is non-contradictory. We know a priori, according to Kant, that logical contradiction is absolutely impossible, which means that, unlike the law of sufficient reason and causality, the principle of identity pertains to both the noumenal and the phenomenal realm. Martin Heidegger goes a step further and also de-absolutizes the law of identity. As he explains, the origin of the basic principles of thought, the law of identity, the law of contradiction, and the law of excluded middle, remains unknown to human thinking. We may take these laws to be normative for our thinking, but they lack any metaphysical foundation. We don't know whether they are derived from thinking itself, or from the object of our thinking, or from neither of the sources. Accordingly, Meyer argues, it is now legitimate to believe 
that the nature of the absolute might be self-contradictory, even, even if it is impossible to know whether this is really the case. Under postmodern conditions, Meyasu explains, it is still possible to talk about God, the absolute or truth, so long as we don't as we don't fall prey to the illusion that this kind of discourse can make rational truth claims. Discussion about the absolute remains meaningful, but only in a mythological or mystical register. Unlike Parmenides, who famously stated that being and thinking are the same, we now learn that being and thinking must be thought as capable of being wholly other. As a result, it is also unthinkable that the unthinkable be impossible. That is to say, we are not able to provide reasons for the absolute impossibility that the absolute could be self-contradictory. According to Meyasu, the more the range of applicability of the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason is restricted, the stronger the agnosticism about the absolute. On the one hand, Religious rationalism or ontotheological conceptions of the God and the Absolute are eliminated, but at the same time, the door is open to the quasi-religious idea of the Holy Other and to a plurality of fideisms. The Absolute can now accommodate an unlimited number of contradicting beliefs, none of which is preferable to the other from the viewpoint of rational argument. Let me uh, return to uh, Ferenczki now. As mentioned above, Florensky wants to explore the unthinkable conditions of thinkability. Now, what is his philosophical proposal about the relationship be between rationality and the absolute? As already outlined, Florensky agrees with postmodern thinkers that the two, bas the two uh, basic principles of rationality, the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason, don't enable us to set out a philosophically and theologically satisfactory notion of truth. He also agrees that the absolute is unthinkable on the basis of classical rationality. Yet he does not accept the idea of the absolute as wholly other and draws a distinction between the uh, rational mind, Rasturuk, and reason or reasonableness, Razum. The rational mind is narrowly constrained by the two principles of rationality, whereas reason constitutes a higher form of rationality. As a Christian thinker, Ferensky's aim is to elucidate the logic of this higher rationality, which he identifies, as we will see, with the Trinitarian Jews. Uh, Trinitarian truth or uh, triune God. Although the existence and revealedness of the Christian truth is presupposed in Ferenczki's thought, he does not just give a top-down account of what he believes to be the Christian idea of truth. Rather, he first raises the question, what must the truth be like if it exists? Or more specifically, what are the formal speculative conditions that would be satisfied if an experience of the truth arose. Florensky points out that the truth cannot be deduced by virtue of a priori epistemological reflection, but is only demonstrable in life experience. It is only when the truth is already given to philosophy that its formal makeup, its properties and rational structure can be examined. Yet, despite Ferenczi's apparently unambiguous statement, he proves impossible to clearly delineate where human anticipatory, anti anticipatory <laughs> reflective activity ends and where external intervention of the transcendent truth begins. Although the human truth seeker cannot anticipate the event of the truth, um, already the process of truth seeking is directed by the truth that truth seeker is looking for, even if its presence remains mysteriously hidden. But what are, according to Ferensky, the speculative conditions that would be satisfied 
if an experience of the truth took place. Um, the, he names three conditions. So the absolute truth exists, the absolute truth is knowable, and thirdly, the absolute truth is given as a fact. That is to say, it is a finite intuition as well as infinite discursion. He explains that truth must be thought of as that which is able to accommodate both principles of rationality, again, the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason. The truth must be intuition discursion. I must synthesize finite intuition with infinite discursion. Finite intuition stands for the reality of the truth and for its self-revelatory character. In other words, truth is here conceived as an event. Discursion safeguards the reasonableness of the truth. The truth is always answerable and, and gives to the skeptical mind a justification of itself. Whatever this justification may consist in at a particular time and in a particular place. Both principles, the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason, remain to some extent normative, but now form a higher type of rationality that violates the lower type of rationality. From the perspective of the lower type of rationality, from the perspective of the rational mind, the higher form of rationality, the synthesis of the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason, is perceived as antinomic, as an antinomy. In Ferensky's Christian philosophy, the antinomic synthesis of the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason is embodied by the triune God. In the light of the experience of the Christian truth, the law of identity, A equals A, needs to be reconfigured. Identity is now based on a chaotic and pedicoretic act of self-emptying and self-rejection, which at the same time enables a person or being, say A, to receive itself back in its self-rejection from another, which Renz called B. The law of sufficient reason is reconfigured in the sense that it now functions as the infinite, dynamic, but circular movement between A, B and the third, uh, which Renz called C. Truth is identified with the Trinitarian perichoresis, like the, the interpenetration between the three uh, divine persons. Quote, Truth is the contemplation of oneself through another in a third, Father, Son, and Spirit. End of quote. Ferensky thus introduces a new ontological paradigm. The multiplicity of coexistence in the sense of alterity and the multiplicity of succession in the sense of temporal change and development now become constitutive of identity since the atomism resulting from the unconditional rule of the law of identity has been overcome. Once again, one should not read this consideration in terms of an a priori deduction of the doctrine of the Trinity, let alone as an apodictic proof that the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is necessary to solve the epistemic impasse, disc impasse described by Ferensky. But it is nonetheless a very original piece of apologetics that seeks to find a way beyond ontotheology and fideism or beyond religious rationalism and irrationalism. When Ferensky writes about the unthinkable conditions of thinkability, he means that these conditions are unthinkable within the framework of classical rationality. But they are not unthinkable in the sense of irrationalism. The postmodern absolute, by contrast, as Mayers explains, may well be completely devoid of any rationality, even if we cannot know whether this is the case. But in what way is Ferensky's transcendent truth the unthinkable condition of rationality? So he hasn't explained this aspect of his statement. For him, the truth in the sense of intuition discursion is the metaphysical ground and root of univocal rationality, of classical rationality, which cannot be thought of as itself being constrained by univocal rationality. The higher perichoretic rationality is richer and more complex than the rationality determined 
by the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason. The truth is envisaged as the possibilizing ground of classical rationality. It is, quote, the domain where rationality with all its norms is rooted. And he writes, without the supra supralogical ground, the principle of rationality would be random without the foundation. From the perspective of rationality, this ground is postulatively necessary, or a postulate of reason, or a regulative principle. So this is terminology borrowed from Kant, but you know he gives it a completely different meaning. Yeah, it's a regulative principle, even if it is perceived as antinomic from the perspective of classical rationality. Rationality and the rational mind demand the synthesis of the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason, but cannot accomplish it without the redeeming presence of the transcendent truth. To sum up, Florensky combines postmodern with uh, pre-modern elements. He deconstructs the traditional principle of rationality and shows why we cannot arrive at an epistemically reliable notion of truth on the basis of these laws or principles. In this respect, Florensky follows what we today call postmodern critiques of ontotheology um, and enlightenment theism. Yet instead of positing a sphere of the absolute that may be completely indeterminate and utterly unintelligible and irrational, he thinks of truth in terms of a higher form of rationality, which he identifies with the Trinitarian perichoresis, again, interpenetration of the three divine persons. And this higher truth is the ground of the lower forms of rationality, of the law of identity, and the law of sufficient reason. Florensky does not attempt to de develop a proof of the existence of the Trinitarian God. Rather, we should think of his approach as a kind of intellectual mystagogy. The truth seeker is invited to join Florensky on an adventurous intellectual and spiritual journey that entails enormous risks and requires a leap of faith. So this leap of faith is required um, in the transition from the lower to the higher form of rationality. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much to uh, both of you. I think we had here two very different papers on two thinkers that were contemporaries, both were working and writing at the very beginning of the 20th century. And both of them were extremely important representatives of what you call the Silver Age in, uh, in Russia. And of course, they had, as you, can, uh, as you heard from Diana, all sorts of personal and close intellectual connections and so on. So um, if you have any comments, questions, the floor is yours. I, I, I'd just like to say two things that have to do with my concept of, uh, of the symposium. You know, I was um, thinking uh, to, to what an extent the experience that Diana described about your work on Rosanov mm. is also my experience working on Florensky and also what this symposium is supposed to address as a problem. You know, can you read an author that you really work with in a very systematic and deep way by completely bracketing out ideas that you disagree with or that you find very stupid? You know, I've worked on Florensky for probably more than 10 years, and I never really read seriously the correspondence, and especially this part of the correspondence with Rosanov, with these anti-Semitic ideas, because every time I started reading them, I thought, oh, this is so stupid, I don't want to read that. I mean, he's written so many interesting, exciting things. Why should I waste my time with stupidities? I guess it's the sort of experience that people have who work on Heidegger and somehow want to bracket out the fact that he was sympathetic to Nazism, that he never excused himself for that, and so on. And I think that this whole experience of getting to know a thinker in such a deep, profound way, because you work on this thinker for years and years, 
and you grow to admire him and you find him inspirational and so on. And then there are these sort of ideas that just because you dislike and you find unpleasant, you just ignore. And I think that partly the idea of the symposium wa was initially to basically to, to, to challenge this way of comfortable reading, reading someone that you admire, you know, in an uncomfortable way, opening up to all these ideas that you might find quite outrageous, you know, anti-Semitism, for example. So I thought that, you know, what you described is something that I guess is uh, an experience that we all share. And partly, as I said, the symposium is about trying to, to, to make us think about that. And then I was listening to Christoph and I thought that, you know, what you're describing in a way is uh, Florensky's idea of truth, which if I understand correctly, it is very much developed as an alternative to the tradition of classical uh, thinking on rationality, Kant and Kantianism and all that. And at the same time, it is uh, a way of thinking about truth which is so close to postmodern thinking. And in a way it shows which is, again, another idea of the symposium. Uh, the, 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 the question I asked at the beginning, how Russian is Russian philosophy? It's partly a lot of the tradition of Russian philosophy is meant to be an alternative to Western philosophy, but what it actually does very often is that it borrows from certain strands of Western philosophy while, you know, criticizing and doing a very good critique of other strands. But it is there always in a dialogue with the Western tradition, and this is why it is actually so easy to make this jump between writings in the 1910s and 20s and contemporary writings by philosophers within the Western tradition. So, yeah. So these were just some, some thoughts about that. And if you have any comments, questions, things you disagreed with, please. Yeah, uh, I found interesting your elegant presentation of Florensky's ideas of uh, truth, and how do you react to his vile anti-Semitic writing? Um, well, I think, Clement uh, uh, already pointed out, I think if we want to understand Florensky, we have to take that into account too, because everything is kind of interconnected in its work. So it's, it's no way one can just uh, bracket it off. But I don't see a, an immediate connection between his anti-Semitism, for instance, and his understanding of truth in the pillar and ground of truth. Even if you <laughs> read through all the footnotes, the thousands of footnotes, it's it's not about he doesn't actually tackle this particular question in the pillar and ground of truth. Although these debates all happen more or less at the same time, which is kind of surprising. So I cannot post, I cannot see a connection between his anti-Semitism and this notion of truth. But there may be one, maybe I don't see yet. Mm. That, that's my, I, I don't think I'll be able to answer this uh, yeah. question uh, properly. I guess it's, uh, it's also a matter of what is your subject of study. Do you read someone because you have this, you find an interesting idea running through his work? Like, for example, I was working on a Florensky's writings on visuality. And in a way, I did bracket off quite a lot of the other things going on there. But then the moment you really become interested in this figure as a thinker, then I think that you cannot just say that, you know, there are these other things. I'm interested in visuality. I'm not interested in the philosophy of language because it's a different thing. Because they're obviously, if you want to understand him as a thinker, all these things are there. So I guess they're connected. It doesn't mean that you cannot look at a certain line of thought without addressing these other issues, but the moment you start working on him as an overall thinker, and I guess that, you know, I don't know, George is behind there, but, you know, you have some of these anti-Semitic ideas with Dostoevsky as well, and, you know, I guess you also, 
you know, you read Dostoevsky, you bracket it all. And probably they don't have to be there in everything you read by Dostoevsky, but the fact is that these ideas are there. And, you know, I suppose that nowadays when people are keep saying that we should revisit this whole tradition, they also mean, like, look at all these aspects that are there. Some of them we like, some of them we dislike, but they are certainly there. And people are complicated and thinkers are complicated. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you, yes. Um, I, not, not on Dostoevsky and anti-Semitism, because that's a, a whole other huge thing to open up. But uh, I mean, I couldn't help thinking, I mean, like, like Christoph, you know, I, I don't have anything like his expertise on Florensky or yours, but, um, you know, I find him hugely illuminating on s certain problems of um, you know, religious epistemology and, 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 and ontology, and didn't know really until today <laughs> about the, the, this other side of it. But I suppose, you know, a bit of me, having been brought up in a sort of British historical empiricism, so it says, well, if you throw out the kind of normal rules of historical evidence in favor of some sort of speculative idea of contradictory truth, then, you know, you just throw the door wide open to the absurdities of anti-Semitism that, uh, you know, I'm not a log historical or <laughs> logical positivist, but in these kinds of discussions it becomes rather appealing because you get this sort of argument that, you know, well, if this person's guilty, that shows that, you know, Jews kill Christian ch children and drink their blood. If he's not guilty, that also proves uh, that the, 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 the Jews do, do this. You know, all evidence becomes somehow irrelevant to what you somehow... No, no, to, no, to be the case. I mean, that's very troubling because I want to sort of <laughs> embrace the sort of models of the truth, that, or some, something like the models of truth that Christoph was talking about. But um, yeah, it, it does does make one hanker for the good old days of hard historical evidence. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, um, in you know, although Ferensky belongs to the tradition of sociology in 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 Russian literature thought as started with Stolovyov, uh, Fransky, and then Bulgakov, and some other representatives. And in a way, they have a very strongly developed doctrine of creation. And they have a very strongly developed doctrine of creation, and Rosanov, of course, too, because he's interested in sexuality, human body, and he says that the church and the Orthodox tradition has neglected this. Mm -hmm. And in a, a very often, theologians or think Christian thinkers who have a developed notion of um, creation emphasize the relative continuity between Judaism and Christianity. Not the discontinuity, you know, for instance, Karl Barth, the, the uh, Swiss theologian Karl Barth, um, has a very weak doctrine of creation. It's they call it, I think, in the English-speaking world, uh, revelatory positivism. And therefore, the Old Testament is not very relevant because there is a radical discontinuity between everything before Christ's revelation and the, the, the Christ event. But again, in, in, uh, in Rosanov and Ferensky, Bulgakov and so on, that's not the case. They have a strongly developed doctrine of creation and therefore, <laughs> in a way, they emphasize continuity between Old and New Testament and that is opposed to any kind of anti-Semitism. So in this sense, actually surprising that there are, of course, many other aspects in Ferensky's work that maybe, you know, point in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And Florensky does mention, I, I just cited this a little bit, that he says, well, the end goal, right, is I the kind of messianism, right, to bring Jews to Christianity because that is the, the logical conclusion. Yeah. But I thought, Diana, that you had these very strong quotes there that are pretty shocking, you know. I wasn't quite even aware of the, <laughs> of the seriousness of yeah. the situation. Yes, yeah. I mean, I had a similar experience that you mentioned that, you know, my first probably hundred read-throughs of, of these letters, I just said, I'm just not going to deal with that right now. <laughs> so I think this was really the first time that I've really sat down and really made myself read them, translate them, and in such a way to kind of uh, start to think about whether, you know, this question of bracketing was appropriate. Yeah. Um, my question may sound a bit provocative in a way, but I was wondering whether um, you could see or, or, or say that this kind of anti-rational or 
refusal of, of empiricism, of a sound empiricism, I would say, um, how much is it opening towards the kind of sloppy thinking you see so widespread in Russia nowadays and which is so um, inspired by a European postmodernism of the kind um, that is in a way usually uh, associated with the ideologues of, of Putinism. So is this kind of um, religious messianic thinking of the early 20th century, isn't it one of the sources of what we see today? Do you want to <laughs> answer first? I'll go, you can go ahead first. Okay. Think about this. Well, I have to emphasize very strongly that Florensky in the Pin on Ground too does not embrace irrationalism at all. So he's trying to find a way beyond religious rationalism and irrationalism. So he's trying to articulate a higher form of rationality. It's kind of similar to uh, William Desmond's work, if you're familiar with William. The, uh, um, so it's not irrationalism, not at all. And secondly, Florensky had a background in mathematics and science. So he was not arbitrarily violating <laughs> the law of identity, but he did very consciously cr uh, criticize the, um, the naive understanding of the law of identity. Um, it's motivated to a large extent by the theological task that we need to think the unity of the world. You know, and if you slavishly stick to the law of identity, you cannot do this because you, you will al always end up with some kind of atomism, ontological, epistemological atomism, and he's trying to overcome this. So it's not irrationalism. And therefore I can't see a connection between uh, irrational political decisions and Florensky, um, I, I can't see a, a connection between the two. Christoph, would you say that he actually, that Florensky comes up with a, what looks to you as a convincing theory of truth? Because I understand, I think, uh, his criticism of the classical tradition and of Kantianism and so on, but the sort of theory that he works towards. Do you think he comes up with, you know, he goes beyond these very good points he makes, uh, the law of identity and things like that, but does he come with his own theory of truth, which actually sounds convincing to you? Because, you know, if, if there is no systematic theory, then, you know, the, the question that was asked is quite a relevant question in the sense that, you know, you open the way to these ideas being developed in one way or another. If you don't come up with a theory, you come up with a critique of something. You open it up to critique, but then people can take it and develop it in different directions. So I, I, I would see, I would understand your question in such a way. I think it, it's very interesting that it remains underdeveloped, even in the pillar. And the weakest point, but I didn't have time to explain this, is he says that the, the classical rationality is rooted in the higher form of rationality. And I find this very unconvincing. He doesn't really explain how it works. Yeah. Because yeah. in the book, there's always, uh, I mentioned in my paper, there's always a competition, you know, so to say, between the lower rationality, the law of identity, law of sufficient reason, and this Trinitarian rationality. Um, and he often talks very polemically about the law of identity. Um, mm. Whereas, in fact, in human life, this is very essential. I mean, he knows that because he's a mathematician and a scientist. B but at least rhetorically, he totally dismisses it in the pillar. Mm. And I think there is a, a biographical um, explanation for this because um, as so many uh, Russian intellectuals, uh, when he was a teenager, he went through a phase of atheism. He, like Solovyov, Bulgakov, were in a similar position. Uh, so he's maybe um, by background he's a kind of highly critical, you know, uh, scientifically minded person. And then he realized that uh, that that won't do, <laughs> that he needs some, something else. And, that is, and the pillar is a kind of, if you like, a reaction to this scientific kind of orientation that he, um, that, he uh, that he clung to for, for some time. You know, and therefore, maybe he's very critical of classical rationality. Mm. And he know, as, as a scientist and mathematician, he knows that the law of identity and the law of sufficient reason are extremely important. So, but I think it's not completely thought through in the pillar. 
how the higher and the lower forms are really interrelated. I think that is uh, one of the main weaknesses in the book. Yeah. Well, I think Florensky is also saying, right, to some degree that um, in order to do this sort of rational thinking, first you have to make a somewhat irrational step of accepting the higher consciousness, right? Which is somewhat resonant for me. I don't want to overstate the relationship, but the sort of Protestant idea of epistemological self-consciousness, that you kind of start from the idea that there is a higher power, a God, and then only after that can you sort of even pretend to be doing any sort of rational thought. Um, and for, for Rosanoff, I would say that y at least in a lot of his writing, he uh, reinforced this idea that the rational was a li limited and possibly not even the most useful way of thinking. Um, he was constantly erasing boundaries between the personal and the private, the philosophical and the literary. Um, so from that perspective, I'm, I would say that he is part of this tradition, perhaps of Russian religious philosophy that does contribute uh, to some of what you mentioned. Yes, please. Um, so the comment being that I think this is just a fascinating panel um, that crystallized something for me that is maybe obvious to others, but it really kind of crystallized for me that um, you can use this bracketing strategy so long as no one else is drawing on those same ideas and making them central to their own sort of reading uh, of a particular work or set of works or, or character. Um, and. So I think that's that's really helpful. So our the strategy is sort of no longer available to us in a way by virtue uh, of the fact that it's become central for these other um, thinkers and actors um, that you know understatement might be that we strongly disagree with or abhor or whatever uh, have you. Um, and then I have more of a, just a cultural historical question. I thought that this was this was Florensky who hated lawyers more than he hated Jewish people. <laughs> or yeah. religious Jewish people. <laughs> it, yeah, it almost sounds like a joke, right? The, the old American joke about lawyers. Um, uh, and I wondered uh, how closely is, is this is this kind of um, a trivial remark, or is it a deeper interest in sort of legal reforms that are happening at the time? Uh, you know, I know Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, of course, are following these reforms and and their intellectual successors and so forth. So I wanted to kind of get a deeper cultural historical um, delve into that, if possible. Um, so that's a great question. So I have to say, I'm not completely sure about involvement in sort of day-to-day -day politics. I assume so. Um, because there are a lot of references in Florensky's letters to Rosanoff about the day-to-day -day kind of happenings. Um, but I think for him, sort of advocate or lawyers becomes a sort of buzzword for um, anything that is post-enlightenment um, and all the things that he perceives to be dangerous about enlightenment thought, um, a sort of over maybe emphasis on the rational. Um, and he accuses um, the Jewish people as a whole of pushing enlightenment through into Europe via the Kabbalah, which I'm still not quite sure how that, that's supposed to work. Um, but I think uh, the, the longer these letters go on, the more advocate just sort of becomes a shorthand as opposed to a, a actually meaning lawyers. Um, and you know, he says that even if religious Jews do these terrible things, I'd prefer them because they have the potential of becoming Christians, whereas those who are purely rational do not. So uh, an advocate so a lawyer is, in other words, an atheist, a shorthand for right. an atheist. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, OK. And it, he's worse than a Jew. A Jew is very bad anyhow, from what we understood here. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Okay, so we have I coffee. Mean, oh, can I just one, 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 uh, yeah, 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 of course, sure. Yeah, I know. I'm not. I'm not talking to theologians, but in a way, uh, one way of understanding Florensky's understanding of of reason or this higher form of rationality is to approach it from a theology of the cross, because he believes that so we are being crucified with Christ. That's mm -hmm. the, the Christian existence. And he believes that this also applies to human reason. So reason needs to be crucified with Christ. And but again, the result is not irrationalism, but a new, f a transformed uh, type of rationality. So uh, it's, uh, it's the result of a theology of the cross, and stood in, a, in, a, in an orthodox, not Lutheran, sense. On this uplifting yeah. note, the <laughs> theology of the cross, we can go <laughs> next door. There's some uh, drinks and cake and so on. And we are going to uh, start again at 6 o'clock.
with uh, George Patterson's talk on uh, Dostoevsky and Putinism. Okay, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>